I want you to get your Bibles ready. We're going on a trip. We're learning in this series that the voice we respond to determines the future we experience, and we have a choice as to the thoughts we consume. For the thoughts we consume will soon consume us. So let's be more selective about what we're listening to. That's the theme of Crash the Chatterbox. And I want to speak today from the book of Exodus. It's the second book in your Bible. And I want to speak from the third chapter and the fourth chapter primarily. We'll dip into chapter two for a minute and grab something, but we won't stay long. Before I begin, this is a little different than the last time I preached the sermon. So put this scripture on the screen, please, support team. I want you to put Psalm. 139 verses 14 and 15 on the screen, please, to set the tone for this message. Psalm 139 verses 14 and 15. The psalmist says, I praise you because I am fearfully. Touch somebody, say, You're fearful. No, that's not what it is. Now, another translation, if there were such a word, would say, Awesomely. Awesomely. Tell them you're awesome. Tell them that. That's better. You're awesome. And wonderfully made. Tell them you're wonderful. Come on, this is going to be an affirmative sermon today. You might get a date by the time this thing is over. You keep sweet talking to your neighbor like that. He says, Your works are wonderful. I've got to really discipline myself because this is not my main text, and there's so much I want to say about it. See, when he says your works are wonderful, he's not just talking about the night sky. He's not just talking about Pluto. He's not just talking about the flowers of spring. He's talking about you and me, the crown jewel of God's creation. He said, your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. I praise you because… I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. I want to use this as a subject today for my message. I know I am. I know I am. The book and the series are both based around four confessions. Not confessions in the sense that you tell a guy in a booth what you did wrong, but confessions in a sense. Confess means say with. And so we're learning to agree with God, to align with God, to speak about our lives, our circumstances, and yes, even ourselves in congruence with the way that God speaks about us. The four confessions attack four specific areas of chatter where we tend to hear a lot of noise that keeps us from believing what God says. So the first confession that we'll deal with today is God says, I am. God says, I am. The second one we'll deal with next week is God says he will. That's attacking fear in our lives. God says he will. Then we'll talk about how to deal with shame and condemnation with the confession God says he has. How God speaks in past tense about battles that you're currently fighting. I can't wait to share that. And then we're going to encourage somebody the next week who's discouraged and we're going to attack discouragement with the confession God says I can. And we're going to learn how to say these things, not only out loud, but internally, until what God says becomes what we see in every area of our lives. That's the goal of this series. Amen. This week we're dealing with insecurity. And we could give a lot of different definitions of insecurity. I'd like to share rather than a clinical definition of insecurity, because you know, you could look at it kind of like it's when you think differently of yourself than how God thinks of you, but I want to express it rather than in terms of a Wikipedia-type treatment of insecurity, what it is. I want to talk about the feeling that it creates and see if you can identify with it. I read a book. Um, I read part of a book. I always like to be honest with you. I usually stop after I get what I want out of it. And This book is called Daring Greatly by Brene Brown, and uh, she talks about vulnerability in her book and how the key to experiencing wholeness in your life is the willingness to be vulnerable. The key to experiencing love in your life is being exposed. What does that look like? She says that most of us are driven by a scarcity mentality when it comes to ourselves. Okay? And she says that, and I agree, 
the underlying thing that, that most of us think when we're presented with a challenge or when we're presented with a, a character flaw in ourselves looks something like this. I'd like you to think about this statement with me. She says, the primary thing that most of us think about throughout our days sounds like this. I am never blank enough. I left the blank because the sentiment itself is, is significant, and the, 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 the specific thing that you think you're not enough of can change, not only from person to person, but from moment to moment. And so I, I relate to this sentiment. How many of you relate to it? I'll turn around. I won't even look at you. You can just put your hands up. Come on. Just, if you can relate, I am never enough. Let, let's go deeper. I need you now to help me fill in the blanks. I'll get you started. I am never, here's mine, smart enough. I feel that way so often. I feel like the dumbest person in the room sometimes. Truly. I get around a bunch of preachers who have been doing it for 25, 30 years, and they know things I haven't learned yet. I am never experienced enough. Help me now. I need to know how screwed up you are. What do you think about? I am never good. Good enough. Yeah, yeah, good enough. I'm never patient enough. You sound like you have some preschoolers. Anybody got preschoolers? I'm never patient enough. I am never consistent enough. Yeah, yeah. I start it and I stop it. And I, what else? I'm, ne I'm, never, I'm never strong enough. Are you strong enough to be my man? You don't know about Cheryl Crow. I am never. What is it? What is it? I, I am never loved enough. I am never rich enough. I am never, huh? Organized enough. I'm never loved. Oh, somebody said that. Come on now, keep track at home. I am never. Somebody said the last time I preached this message, they said. I am never awesome enough. <laughs> I thought that was brilliant. I am. We could fill in the blank all day long, and you won't really be honest about the real one. You're giving me the churchy ones right now. <laughs> I wish we could dig deeper, but let's move on. I, I want to talk today directly to that sentiment that most of us feel, that soundtrack that plays in our minds that says, I am never enough the essence of insecurity. and I want us to look at one of the people in the Bible that God used in the greatest way who struggled with insecurity in his deepest parts. And I'm talking about Moses, the, the pastor, the leader of the Old Testament ecclesia, the church, the called out, the gathered. He was a deliverer, but before he could deliver others, there are some things God had to deliver him from. We're going to look at three specific things in his life that almost eliminated his understanding of God's purpose for him. And I think you'll relate to him as well. In the book, in the section, I talked about Mary, the mother of Jesus. And I wanted to use a different character today because it is my assumption that many of you will read the book, and I don't want to regurgitate what you've already read. So let's go deeper. Touch somebody, say, let's go deeper. And I don't just mean deeper into the content of the book. Let's go deeper in ourselves and find out what drives our behavior. I believe that so much of our behavior that misses the mark of God's calling for our lives is the result of insecurity. I was talking to somebody the other day, and they said, you know what the problem is with kids these days? They think they're so special. They think everybody needs to know what they ate for lunch. And so they put it on their Facebook machine. And they think that they were going on and on. Kids these days think they're so special, as if that's the driving and, and, and dominant reason that, 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 that people don't live up to God's calling on their lives. I want to suggest to you today that I think the problem with kids these days, or kids yesterday, or kids 50 years ago, or, or kids 100 years from now, or even the scriptural characters that we now know as heroes, isn't that they think they're so special, but that they have no clue how special that they are. So now our lives begin to be driven by this need to prove something that God has already spoken. 
So let's look at Moses. Let's look at Moses and see if he proves the theory to be correct. Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. Scripture says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father in law. Jethro, his father in law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. So we know that he's, he's isolated and alone. And there, everybody say there. there. Often God will speak to you once he gets you all by yourself. Once he gets you away from all the other voices, all the other people who are telling you what you are and what you're not, the scripture says, There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. God can speak to you in extraordinary ways through simple, ordinary occurrences. But this is pretty crazy because scripture says that Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it didn't burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and See this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. I got to check this out. You don't see this every day. And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing. Is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. This is going to be good. The home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, but there are going to be enemies. It's going to be a good land, but you're going to have to fight the good fight to take them into the good land. But I want to take you somewhere, Moses. And now, verse 9, the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. God is speaking through a burning bush to a man who didn't expect it. He's calling him by name, not once but twice. Moses, Moses. When you see something twice in Scripture, it's a sign of covenant. It's God reminding someone of his promise. Moses, Moses. And Not only does God call his name, but he carries on a complete conversation with Moses. Not just a conversation about how's the weather and how's my boy Jethro. Is he treating you all right? Is he paying you a fair wage? But Moses, I have chosen you and called you to carry my cause and to stand before enemies and to deliver my people. Verse 11 is kind of sad, but Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world, and tell him to bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I? In the scripture, we're watching a conversation between two characters. There's God, there's Moses. The bush doesn't count as a character. That's just the medium that God spoke through. That's just the, the transmission station for the message. But I want to suggest to you that there's a third character that is not mentioned, but is implied and is obvious, and that is the chatter. The, 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 the chatterbox. Because here is God telling Moses all about who he is. I am God. I have come down. And Moses' instinctive response, and you'll relate to this, is But who am I? Who, who am I? Now I want to give you some thoughts. And these thoughts are, are not Moses' exact words. 
but, but they are driving his insecurity. You can hear it in his voice. You can see it in his actions. You, you can feel it in his hesitancy. Who am I? God, I'm enjoying this conversation. I can't wait to tell my friends that you showed up and lit this bush on fire. This is really special. I, I appreciate the, the, the midday interruption to an otherwise uh, arduous and, and, and somewhat uh, nondescript task. But, but who am I? Who, who am I that I should do it? Here's what Moses is thinking. I want you to follow me. See if you've ever felt this way. I'm so dysfunctional. I'm so dysfunctional. Now I need to give you some background. See, because if you just read this specific text, you may think that the reason Moses said, Who am I? is because he felt too unimportant for such a significant task. But that's not all that's happening here. See, in, in order to really understand the chatter that somebody deals with, you have to understand the history. Of their own personal experience. Because the enemy will use your history to inform your insecurity. So, so we've got one voice speaking to Moses saying, I am the Lord, and I have come down, and I am concerned about my people, and I am sending you. I'm, I'm choosing you. And, and then we've got Moses flipping the question saying, I hear who you are, but who am I? I'm a messed up man. In fact, God, I'm a murderer. I don't know if you knew this about Moses, but many years before this burning bush incident, many years before God chose him, Moses saw a situation and tried to take matters into his own hands, and he messed it up as we always do when we try to do something without consulting God. Look at this. So Moses is going out one day, and he is a Hebrew by birth, but he's been raised in an Egyptian culture, and he's sick and tired of seeing his people taken advantage of and oppressed by the Egyptians. Scripture says, Exodus chapter 2, verse 11, one day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, and looking this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And the next day, he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting, and he asked the one in the wrong, Why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? And the man said, verse 14, Who made you ruler and judge over us? You thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Yeah, that's right. I saw it. You thought nobody was around. We've heard about it. And the chatter starts. Scripture says, then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did, what I did, what I did must have become known. And when Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Now it's many years later. Moses has married a woman. He's working for her dad. He's, he's, he's taking care of business on a very simple level, and God starts speaking to him about what God wants him to do, how God wants to use him. But as soon as God starts telling you what he wants to do through you, the enemy will start reminding you of what you did that means you can't can't be used like God has purposed. I'm so dysfunctional. God, I'm sure you're able to deliver these people, but who am I? Who am I? Look at me. I'm a man in hiding. God, I'm hiding my face because I can't even stand the thought of looking at someone as holy as you. Who am I? that you are mindful of me. Who am I that you would visit me in this way? Who am I that God would have a plan for my life? Who am I? I'm so messed up. I'm so jacked up. You know, I chose the word dysfunctional because it starts with the letter D, and I wanted my outline to all have words that started with the letter D. You'll see there are two more in a minute, and I think it's very artistic, and it'll help your memory, and I work very hard on it, so I'd like you to pretend like you think it's clever as well. But if I really put the word up there, it wouldn't be that nice. That's not what the chatterbox tells you. And, and notice the chatterbox speaks in first person. The way you hear it and experience it isn't, you are so dysfunctional, because if you heard it like that, you could argue with it. 
You could filibuster the devil if he was arguing with you, but what he does is he internalizes it and makes you say it to yourself. Who am I? Messed up as I am, jacked up as I am, screwed up as I am. We're going to keep it right there as screwed up. Let's keep it churchy. Touch somebody and say, he's going to keep it churchy. But what you really think, we can't put on the screen. I'm so dysfunctional. I'm such a mess because I remember what I did. I got to take it a little further. It's not just what you did before you met Christ that makes you feel dysfunctional. It's all the stuff that hasn't changed even though you do know him. I've got all day. I will wait for an amen. At the same time I'm hearing God's voice speak about who he is and what he can do. I'm hearing that voice in chapter 2 saying, I know what you did. I know who you really are. You got all these people fooled. You're nothing but a freak on the inside. And you'll never be anything else. Chatter. The chatter. The chatter. The bush is burning. The Lord is speaking, but the chatter has never been louder for Moses. And I think the problem is that when someone really knows us, it creates a sense of guardedness. And nobody knows you better than God. So it's hard to let him in and let him speak to the places that no one else sees because he knows you. I remember a season where our oldest son, Elijah, he was probably four years old, five years old. Maybe he was even only three. I don't remember, but it was so cute at the time. When we would call his name, he had this thing he would say, and he did it for a couple of months. And I tell him about it now, he laughs. We call his name, and he'd go, How do you know my name? How do you know my name? How do you. <laughs> Boy, I gave you your name. I made you. And, 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 and there's a sense in which Moses here is completely caught off guard. How do you know my. Who am I? That you would love me. Do you ever wonder how can God know me so well and still love me so much? I'm so dysfunctional. Absolutely. Who who am I? And here's the second thought. Not only am I dysfunctional, but I'm so deficient. Deficient. I'm so deficient. Definition of deficient. Lacking something that is needed. Not having enough of something. I'm never skilled enough. I'm never talented enough. I'm never insightful enough. I'm never decisive. I'm, in a single word, deficient. Lacking something that is needed. Not having enough of something necessary or a problem in the way something is made or formed. Let's read on with Moses. Go with me to chapter 4, verse 10. Let me catch you up because we just skipped a lot of verses. So God's like, Moses, I want to prove it to you that it's me talking. And Moses is like, well, you don't really have to prove it to me, but what if the people don't believe that you talk to me? Because I believe it because this bush is burning and it's pretty cool. And it's kind of hard to believe that this is of human origin. But see, the other people aren't going to be out here with me and see the bush. And I'm going to have to tell them that the bush was burning and they might, they might want to check me in or something like that. And so I, I, I need you to give me a way that I can show them because God, I believe you, but they might not believe you. So can you show me something that they'll believe what I believe? Because I believe you. I really do, but I need a sign. And so God says, fine, take the little shepherd's staff that you have out here. Uh, that Jethro gave you and throw it on the ground. And then he threw it on the ground and it became a snake. And Moses picked it back up and the snake turned back into a stick and he turned it uh, back down. That's a pretty crazy story. Like you, you throw a stick on the ground, it becomes a snake. You pick the snake up, it turns back into a stick. That's pretty crazy. That'll prove to you that something is not normal about this encounter. And then the next thing God says is, is if they don't believe that sign, then I want you to uh, do this sign. Now put your hand in your cloak. So Moses puts his hand in, in his cloak and when he pulls it back out, his hand is, is white. It's leprous. It's, it's, le it's leprous. It's, 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 a, it's a skin disease on his hand. And so, and so God 
God says, now put it back in your cloak. And Moses puts it back in his cloak. He pulls it back out, and it's, it's normal again. And Moses says, okay, I believe you. And God says, but if that don't work, I got one more, and I'm not going to show you this one because we're out here in the desert. But when you get to the uh, place where you can get some water, if you take some water out of the Nile River and pour it on the ground, the water will become blood. And if they're not convinced by the snake thing or your skin uh, turning into leprous uh, skin and all, your hand almost falling off and then being whole again just a few moments later, then pour some water on the ground. When the water becomes blood, they'll know it's me. Now we're at Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. Even after seeing all this, Moses said to the Lord, You know, you can see God do remarkable things, but still be insecure. And Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. The water, blood, snake stick, hand disease thing is pretty cool. But pardon me, I have never been eloquent. You want me to go to Pharaoh? And talk him into letting your people go. The problem is, I'm not very good with words, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. In other words, God, I wasn't real good at talking to people before you started talking to me. And from what I can tell, nothing has changed in the last five minutes. So, unless you know something I don't, you got the wrong guy. I'm not very good at this. I'm so deficient. I, I can't speak like others speak. I can't do what others do. There's somebody more fitted for this than, than me. I'm slow. I am slow of speech and tongue. And the Lord said to him, Who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I'll help you speak and will teach you what to say. I'll be your speech instructor. I'll be your coach. I'll fill your mouth. I'll give you words. I'll make you bold. I'll string your sentences together. I'll write the script. Who made you, Moses? Remember in chapter 2, that's the same thing that the Hebrew said to Moses to accuse him. Who made you ruler and judge over us? Now we're in chapter 3, and God wants to know, who made you the way you are? See, when you doubt the product, it insults the manufacturer. And you got to come to the place in your life where you honestly believe that if God left it out of you, it is not needed to accomplish your destiny. If he left it out… I used to think that insecurity was like a form of humility. You know, like certain people struggle with pride. They're too confident in themselves. They think they're so special. But then other people, they're just a little too humble, and it makes them insecure. But do you not know that insecurity is the ultimate insult to God? Yeah. Who made you? Who, who put you together like that? When you imply that you're deficient, it says something about what you think about God's ability. I'm so deficient. This is where we get into comparison. Some of us are insecure about our deficiencies because we're comparing ourselves against someone else's calling. You're judging what you can do against what somebody else can do, and that will lead to insecurity and a hyper awareness of your deficiency every single time. Man, I thought I was doing pretty good for Valentine's Day for my woman till I checked Instagram. No, I'm serious. I thought I took pretty good care of Holly. Then I saw one of my friends took his wife on a horseback ride. I said, my God, I thought the chocolate was nice, but now this dude done got, went and got a horse. I can't keep up with that. <laughs> Come on, it's true. I thought I was doing pretty good till I looked at them. I, I, I can't do it like they can. 
I can't make it happen like they can. I, just things don't work out for me like they do. I'll tell you where I really felt it is this, um, this uh, snowstorm that, that we had. This snowstorm brought out some insecurities in me because I was seeing everybody else's snowman. Now, I knew that this is probably the biggest snow my kids might experience in their childhood here in North Carolina. And so I tried to make a snowman. And they said, Well, this is the good snow. This is the packing snow. But it doesn't matter if it's packing snow if you don't know how to pack. I was packing and packing and packing, and out of my head, I'm cussing because his snowman looks so good, and he just put, put it together so easy. So, what I'm saying is, Listen, I'm, I'm using common funny examples, but it gets much deeper than that. I'm never fun enough with my kids. I'm, I'm, never, I'm, never, I'm never a disciplinarian enough. And, and, and the thing is, when you're fun, you're not a disciplinarian. When you're a disciplinarian, you're not fun. So either way, you suck. If you believe this, it's a trap. It's a trap. God said, Who made you? I think the antidote to insecurity is getting back to the source. Who made you? Who made you that way? If he'd have wanted you to have more, he'd have given you more. If he'd have needed you to grow up in a different background, you'd have been born in a different neighborhood. If he'd have needed you to understand that, you'd have understood that. Who made you? Who made you? Is it not I, the Lord? And now Moses is out of excuses. He's totally out of excuses. So he throws out one last plea before the judge. He's already seen that his past isn't going to confine him because God has already gone into his future. He's already seen that the doubts that he has about uh, God's power or the doubts that others might have about God's power will not be effective because God has given him a sign. He's already seen that even his own deficiencies and what he's not able to do will only serve as a platform for God to fulfill his purpose because sometimes God wants you to do something that you don't feel like you're very good at, so you'll be leaning on him and not on your own understanding. But Moses still doesn't believe it. And he says, verse 13, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. No excuse this time. I can see this negotiation isn't working. So how about a plea bargain? Just send someone else. I'm so doubtful. I'm so doubtful. He said, just send someone else. We're watching a man wrestle with fundamental insecurity when charged with the largest task that one can imagine. And we're watching him come to the end of himself, assessing himself, arguing with his God, and coming up short. Verse 14 says, Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, What about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He's already on his way to meet you. He'll be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. In other words, Moses, although you won't go wrong along with my original plan, I'll still use you. I'll still use you. You're not following along with this thing perfectly, but I'll still go with you. I'm not giving up on you. He, verse 16, will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand so you can perform those cool tricks I showed you about. I see so many doubts in Moses that resonate with me. You know what's interesting? Nowhere in this passage do we ever get the impression that Moses doubted God. Isn't that interesting? Think through all the scriptures that we just read. 
Not one time in anything that Moses said does he doubt what God is able to do. For years as a preacher, I thought that the problem with people who weren't living up to their potential in Christ was that they just didn't believe in God's power enough. And so I preached to that end. Trust God more. Believe God more. He is able. He can do anything. Until I started to discover that for most of us, it's not God we doubt. It's that God can do it through us. I don't doubt you can do it, God. I just doubt whether or not I'm fit to be a part of what you're doing. So doubtful. I'm, I'm, I'm full of doubts about whether I can do it, not whether you can do it. I don't doubt you, God. I, I, just, I just doubt me. I, I, don't, I don't doubt you a bit, God. I've seen what you're able to do. I've heard what you said, and I know you'll do what you intend to do. It's just me I'm worried about because I know me, and you know me, and it's not who you are, but it's who I am that's causing me issues in this relationship. It's not you. You ever had somebody tell you that when they were breaking up with you? It's not you. It's not you. That's what we're saying to God. It's not you, God. It's me. I have no doubt that you'll deliver your people. I have no doubt you'll do great things. But but just but just pass me by. You don't want me for the you. It's not you, God. It's me. I'm not enough. Here's what changes things for me. I left out a part of the conversation between God and Moses that to me is the fundamental key. I could say even it's like the Rosetta Stone to understand how to deal with your insecurity. And I want you to read with me now chapter 3, verses 13 through 15, where Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites. Let's just say I go along with this. And I say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? So, God, if I'm going to go represent you to these people, I need a name to give them. I need to know whose business I'm conducting. What shall I tell them? Now, remember, the bush is burning, and God is somehow speaking to Moses through the bush. So let's let this podium be the bush for this illustration. Bush is burning. God is speaking. And out of that bush, God says to Moses, verse 14, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. Let's replay it. God, if I'm going to go in your name, I need to know what your name is. Can you give me your name? I'm listening. And God says, I am. I'm sorry, God. You're breaking up. Can you say that again? I only got the first part of that. I got the I am. I am who I am. Hang on, God. Maybe the reception is better here on this side of the bush. So, God, I was just saying that I need to know who you are so when I go to the people, I can tell them who sent me. Who are you now? What's your name? I am. That's the whole name? I am. Really? I am. That's my name. I am. I've studied this meticulously. I wanted to understand why God would give Moses such an ambiguous answer when what Moses needed more than anything was certainty. Now, one theologian in my commentary wrote an entire article about how when God says, I am, the focus of his statement is his present tenseness. Okay? So I'm not just the God who was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I'm not just the God who will be. I'm the God who is. I, I, I am. 
I am, I am a very present help in the time of trouble. So I'm not just God when you get out of this situation. I'm not just God when you get your crap together. I'm not just God when you grow up a little bit. I'm not just God when you quit cussing. I'm not just God once you resolve this relationship. I wasn't just God for your grandmother. I wasn't just God for your mom. I wasn't just God in the Bible. I wasn't just God for Moses. I'm a 2014 God. I show up in any situation. I am. I am. I am. I am. But there's another dimension of this. There's another dimension. Not only is God saying, I am, like I am right now, this is called the isness of God. <laughs> no, it's a theological term. Google it. The isness of God. He is. He is. But it's also open ended. I am. I am. I am. In other words, Moses, I know you're doubtful. I know you're deficient. I know you're dysfunctional. But I am the God who fills in your blank. I am the God who is whatever you're not. I am. That's my name. I am. That's what I do. I am. That's how you refer to me. I am. That's how I want you to see me. And whatever you're not, when I start speaking, I will be to you if you trust me. I am. I am. But God, I'm not very good. And God says, I know. I am. Ooh. Yeah, but God, I'm, I'm not very skilled. I don't really know what I'm doing. I, I, I'm, I'm not really certain how this thing's going to turn out. God says, I know. I am. Ooh. God, I'm, 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 not, I'm not really sure about this. God, I'm not really confident. I'm not really a steady person. And God says, I know. I see you. But I am. I am. Not about what you are. It's about who I am. I, I got to hustle. I got to hustle. I got one more thing to show you. This is the dynamite. Oh my God. I read about how God used Moses anyway. How Moses led the people across the Red Sea, doubts and all, dysfunctions and all, deficiencies and all. I read about how God called him up on a mountain and gave him Ten Commandments. I read one of those commandments in Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, and I've seen it all my life, but I never saw it quite like this. Because I was reading about how God's name is I am. And now he said, This will be my name for all generations. I am. And then I read about in Exodus 20, verse 7, that one of the commands that God gave Moses to give the children of Israel goes like this He says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Growing up, I always thought that commandment had a very specific and limited application. Don't say, Oh my God. Or don't say, dear Lord, or don't say Jesus Christ like a swear word. And I get that, and I'm with that, and we got to honor how we use God's name. But this isn't just a command about how you use God's name, it's a command about how you take his name. Now, let me give you an analogy about taking somebody's name that might be more familiar to us. It might translate what the Hebrews would have seen when they saw this command. See, in, 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 in times past, there was, a, there was a girl named Holly Boytnock. But on the greatest day of her life, she became a furtic. What happened? They didn't just change her driver's license, they didn't just change her passport. She didn't just get downgraded from one of the worst last names you can have, Boytnot, to probably the worst name, Fertick. Hard to go down from Boytnot, but somehow you did it. But when she took my name, she became one with me. She became part of me. What we do, we do together. What we have, we have together. We didn't sign a prenup. You don't need a prenup for $35 in your savings account. We didn't need one. We just in this together. She took my name. Let me tell you what happened to you on the greatest day of your life when you became a Christian, when you called on the name of Jesus, when you asked him to come in and turn your life around. You took his name. You became one with him. 
What he has, you have. There ain't no prenup. Whatever he's got, you've got. You became a participant in the divine nature. Hold on a second. And so God says, when you say I am, and you start filling in the blanks with stuff that contradicts what I've said about you. You are taking my name in vain because you're one with me, because we're in relationship together. So don't take my name in vain. When you walk around in insecurity and you say stuff like, I'm so stupid. I'm such an idiot. I'm such a loser. I'm such a terrible mom. God says, I'm not any of those things. And if I'm in you, you're not either. What I am, you are. Stop taking my name in vain. So, you say, but God, I'm so dysfunctional. And God says, yeah, but I am so gracious. You say, yeah, but God, I'm so deficient. And God says, but I am so sufficient. My grace is sufficient for you, for you, for you. Touch somebody, say for you, for you. God, I'm. I'm so doubtful, and God says, I am so faithful. I am. Whatever you're not, whatever you need, whatever you didn't get from your parents, I am. Whatever you're not getting from somebody else, let me be it to you. I am. 